Welcome to the Northampton School Committee meeting for Thursday, June 28th, 2012. Uh, we are uh, reconvening after having been in executive session. And uh, I will uh, begin by asking the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Mr. Michael Flynn. Here. Mr. Downey Myers. Here. Mr. Howard Moore. Here. Ms. Lisa Minnett. Here. 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 Present. Present. Here. Oh, I'm sorry. Just moving off. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is the public comment period. Um, I do not see any members of the public here, so unless. Uh, we have members of the public. So uh, we will then move on to any announcements by the school committee. Are there any announcements? Okay, hearing none. We'll then move on to the recommended actions, and this would be the consent agenda. Um, included in the consent agenda tonight are the approval of minutes of the budget and property meeting of Thursday, June 7, uh, 2012, uh, and the approval of minutes of the school committee. Uh, Thursday, Thursday, June 14th has been moved. It's been moved. Okay, so we'll, uh, sorry about that. <coughs> quite understand what that annotation meant. Uh, we also have two contracts. One is Novell Software Incorporated, $6,036.75. This is a system operating license. And then the firm of Myrick O'Connell for $79,000 for legal services. There, finally, there is a field trip request for Jackson Street School, fifth grade, nature's classroom, October 9th through the 12th, 2012, Beckett, Massachusetts. That is the consent agenda, and I would entertain a motion to approve. Approval of the consent Sorry. agenda as presented. Second. Okay. Uh, there's a question. Um, on the contract for Merrick O'Connell, is this a set amount, or is this an up to amount? Um, this is a total of 79,000. This is the same number that you voted on in the budget. Um, I put the same number in. This is for this coming year? Correct, of FY13. But generally, that's, it's not a set amount. It's, uh, we are approving up to this up, amount? Up right. to that amount, okay, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda, say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Any abstentions? The next item on the agenda uh, are reports and recommendations. And tonight we have uh, uh, the next set of uh, school improvement plan presentations uh, from uh, the high school, Ridge Street School, and Lead School. And we'll we'll take them in that order. We'll take them in that order. So we would uh, welcome uh, NHS principal, uh, Nancy Athens. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here on a nice summer night. Um, I'm here to talk to you about my school improvement plan that I came to to you probably uh, about eight months ago to tell you how we're doing at the high school. I would first like to say and I'd like to thank the people who helped me develop it, my school women to develop it, my school council, uh, community members, parents, and my staff. And we worked hard at it, and it was really delightful to use uh, product like this rather than the very cumbersome school improvement plan that we had been working with for many, many years. And in reviewing it and going back over it, the, the data that was collected was very helpful to me and to my colleagues in looking at what we're doing in our high school. So my first item was to increase the number of low-income students, students of color, ELL, special education student, who are enrolled in honors and advanced placement classes by 5% to improve student achievement and decrease the achievement gap. Research shows that if students are enrolled in these classes that they will do better as they move along in terms of their high school experience. And the research in college is very clear that if a student comes in having taken an AP advanced placement class that their skill set is much better entering the college force. Um, in October, I wanted to give 100% PSATs to all sophomores. It was a lofty goal. Um, in terms of looking at my data, 
uh, there's probably about 10% of the kids due to cognitive cognitive difficulty, ELL, um, some other circumstance that just can't take the PSATs. So um, in looking at it, we ended up with 70% of the sophomores taking PSATs and 83% of the juniors. The sophomores, we paid for them to take it. The juniors, we did not. And we are going to encourage more students again next year through guidance to take the PSATs. Guidance uses them and they use them to identify students who um, may enter into the higher level classes and they encourage and they call them down to their office and they show them the scores and they show them what the scores <coughs> actually mean. In, as far as a 2% increase in student attendance, I, I was a bit disappointed that it remained right around 95%. And not that that's a bad thing, but um, we're going to look at different ways in, to encourage students um, to come to school. Um, we have guidance this year. They are going to do an eighth grade orientation night or ninth grade orientation night on August 28th or during the day. And in the evening, I am going to host the ninth grade parents and really try to drive home the importance to build a culture of attendance, um, why it's so very important that you attend school every day. Um, <clears throat> we are going to do parent phone calls. We're going to work with Kelly Knight. This year I bought student planners through the help of the PTO to help organize the ninth grade students um, and talk, we talk about in attendance in there as well. And um, we're gonna monitor the attendance quarterly and really take a look at the students that are out very frequently. So hopefully next, at the end of next year when I come to you, that percentage will go up a bit, but we're gonna, we're gonna keep going at it. Um, we're going to increase the number of students entering the ninth grade in honors English classes from 60 to 65 percent and I'm happy to report with this class coming in or with this um, next year that it's up to 69 percent. So I, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with that. It was an increase of, of 12 students that are going to enter into the ninth grade honors classes. Um, as far as the achievement gap, uh, we have collaboration with Smith College. Hoyo Community College, GCC, and STIC. I met with the president of Smith College this year, and she talked to me about um, enrolling other schools interested in coming to Smith College, but that Northampton would definitely be at the top of the list to come back to Smith. We also talked about the ALP program, the alternative program, and seeing if we may be able to place some students in the Smith College um, schools so that they would have the opportunity to see what college was like. GCC has, has a program as well, but transportation is, is a huge is issue trying to get back and forth um, there. The Partners in Health program that you know about or we've talked about is also working with um, Smith College, the group at Smith College, and they're trying to develop a ninth grade, sort of an orientation program, but a way that they may um, really target ninth graders and to help them acclimate into the high school because we found that if you start in the ninth grade and the students are really acclimating into the high school, it makes the rest of the trip pretty easy. Again, we're part of the MIMSI grant, unfortunately, after this year, after next year, I should say, 2012-2013, um, the five years is up. It's quite unbelievable that it went by that quickly. I do believe they're going to try, try to find some way to keep us because many of the staff are actually teaching for them, so the professional development piece they, they would like to keep in place. Um, <clears throat> students took exams this year in subjects that are not offered here at the high school. I listed them environmental science, Calc AB, music theory, physics, C, EM, Italian, macroeconomics, um, and where were the numbers? Six, 661 exams in 19 subject areas. And as I, I believe that the AP results are coming back within the next few weeks. So we'll be able to take a look and see how our students did. Um, we had a great collaboration with middle school, middle school guidance counselors who identify students who come into our schools who are going to have difficulty. This year through the MCAS grant, we were able to um, hire a teacher who actually did some student support work with those students and they were very, very successful. And then we had um, that person team teaching a biology class because as you remember, last year when we looked at the achievement gap, the biology and um, the math was very difficult for a lot of our students because biology, they have to condense it into one semester. 
Um, so I'm happy to report that was successful. The SAL program is running again with Salem Derby and the middle, middle school teachers in Smith College where they also identify students at risk and they actually work with them on team building and collaboration over the summer. And then they enter into the ninth grade with someone that they know, um, i.e. Salem Derby. Um, <clears throat> The ALP program, we, we graduated two students this year, and we actually have five caught up, seniors, so that's encouraging. And the licensed social worker um, is hired for 2012-2013. Uh, the race to the top, the addition of our point five gui guidance counselor was very helpful. She worked with um, the ALP program and many of our first generation students going on to school. They, they would be the first generation going on. And she had them go to HCC for trips showed them, helped them with the AccuPlacer, helped them with financial aid, uh, and really was the connection, the push behind to get these kids going. So um, brought them to career fairs. Our homework club is still operating successfully. And um, again, vertical teaming with the middle school. I'm happy to report, as you know, we came before you. The math, we're really excited about what's going to happen next year here at the middle school and then on to the high school. So it'll be a lot of changes um, for all of us. But I think the openness, the open rapport with the two, the two schools is really um, great. Do you want me to con continue or do you want me to, any questions on this part? Do you want to go part oh, by go part? Go right, go straight. Go right through? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so then, the second piece, increase the level of technology integration and instructional practice and offer staff development opportunities to improve instructional practice and integrate the 21st century learning skills. We offered a digi digital literacy course this year and it was very successful. Some of our students took it for credit recovery. Um, I'm happy to report N-Grade, a few high school students were up and running and I've got a lot of positive comments from parents, uh, the kids love it. And you can see how many times people are actually are checking, and they're checking a lot. I think it's been very positive. Um, our teachers went to con a conference, and they received smart clickers, and they're very happy with that. Um, the new web page was launched in January. Again, robotics, our first year with robotics. Uh, we came in third. And then Naviance guidance is really going to town with this and it's great the teachers love it especially teachers that have to write a lot of recommendations it has a career path to it uh, they actually do career uh, career training with um, the ninth grade students and um, <clears throat> they're really every year they get trained on it and they learn more and more and for kids that's how they have to apply um, you know with all their college applications and recommendations etc and then further develop and implement the advisor advisee program to support the social and emotional well-being of both faculty and students and also to build a community at North Hampton High School. Happy to report through the NEF we received the grant for a second year in a row um, with Allison Morris and Deb McElroy. <clears throat> uh, they have been instrumental in helping us to develop the advisory program. And it's been so successful this summer, Brian and I are going to present at a, the principal's conference at Cape Cod um, about our advisory program because it's very unique because it's ungraded. Um, we had so many branches from the advisor advisory program. You know that there was an academic integrity piece to it and they had a contest in Cole Morgan and Coca-Cola supported it and the kids had to do posters or write you know what they thought about academic integrity and um, they really got involved with it and it, it was great we showed the race to nowhere to our entire student body and then the next day we had the advisories um, talk about it uh, this year we had a culminating field day and you get uh, at the end right the last day of school actually on that Friday the kids went out in the field and with advisories and it, it was great and usually you don't see high school kids you know doing that but um, they had a ball and um, so we're going to actually enhance it for next year through the advisories we're going to start a student government in September uh, the, the kids got together and through the advisories and also through NIAS they wanted more of a voice in, in our school because we, we don't have a student council or a student government um, and then a new Interact Club was formed as well. It was developed by students to promote awareness about third world countries. I'm happy to also tell you that we were selected by the Washington Post as one of the top high schools in the nation. It ranked, si ranked 16th in Massachusetts. It's based on the number of students taking AP classes and scoring three or better on AP tests. 
I'm also happy to report that the ask is over and we're looking forward to a year that we are moving in a different direction. It was extremely helpful and it was very rewarding. Um, and again, it is my professional goal to begin to build professional learning communities at Northampton High School along with new evaluations and everything else. So. So now you want me to go on to the next one? Plan for next year. Okay. So I'm going to pass out a plan. I, there is a error, a typo error in dates. So I wanted you to have an unto date one. So Joseph has. Joseph did. Oh, he did? Joseph. Okay, so um, in the first part of it, I'm leaving it the same about the achievement gap and working on that. Um, I am going to go back to my school console and I again I'm going to discuss with them and change the 100% of the sophomore class will participate in PSAT testing because as I said to you I think it is pretty um, unrealistic. I'm going to try again to go to the 97% for my um, attendance rate and I've moved for the uh, getting into the honors English classes from 69% to 72% a 4% increase. In the technology area I'm going to continue to go forward with N-Grade. Faculty are all using it, but what I would really like to do is enhance it a little more and so they're more comfortable with it. Um, two, profession, two professional development days again and purchase at least one new piece of technology and I can't thank the PTO enough. They're very good about um, always helping us out with technology. Uh, I'm really pushing forward with the increase in the number of online and credit recovery courses at, at this um, juncture, I am <coughs> some online programs for students. Many of the schools are doing summer school um, online programs. Our credit recovery, for example, this year there was a guidance counselor that identified already there are nine students on her caseload that have 19 credits, which is almost an impossibility to graduate because you only have the option of getting eight, so you're going to have to take a course somewhere. and. Um, they, what they've done with the online programs is they've actually decreased the price of them so it becomes more user friendly and not only can you do online classes but you can do AP classes as well, you can do business classes, um, you have to have a staff person who can oversee it and so again looking to the future of the, of the Common Core, um, those types of things will help us at a, a reduced rate of cost to offer what we need to offer to students and the, the technology, we had a demo the other day from um, EDU 2002 and we looked at Odyssey and Play-Doh, and the technology is incredible, and it's really user-friendly, and it's easy um, for the students to do. Um, and then engage 85% of our students in classroom technology instruction to improve student learning. And uh, again, today when we uh, interviewed for IT, it's really exciting what's out there, and I'm, I'm excited to think that we're moving in that direction, that um, our teachers who are so good at it will be able to um, engage. And again, I, we're going to continue with the advisor advisee program. We are doing something uh, peer tutoring. Uh, we're going to train 15 students through high five, and they are going to be the peer leaders in each of the groups, and the teachers will train with them as well. That's going to be kind of a, a new addition to our advisor advisee program. We've also committed at the end of next year to look at to see if we wanted to remain ungraded because that, that's the tricky part of when you're ungraded. You, you have to come up with new lessons every year because they've all, they've all seen the same thing. But the students wanted that and, and we went with it for the first two years. Um, <clears throat> we were going to continue to provide teachers with the, the same kind of PD that they had last year. It worked very well. Um, and again, we, ha we don't have the data in to see if there has been a 3% decrease in discipline referrals from 22 to 19% and a 3% decrease in the number of freshmen who do not earn enough credit. I will have that information very shortly and I can put it in one of the packets um, so that you may, may see it. So that, that is my improvement plan for next year. Um, does anybody have any questions? Mr. Meyer, I had a question about the PSATs and so if there's a population of students who for them the PSAT is not the appropriate instrument to identify whether they're uh -huh. have, you know the ability uh, to go into the AP and honors classes do you have a sense of an alternative instrument that might work an alternative assessment that might work for that group of students other other than that you know standardized testing model well s some of those students are cognitively they can't right. do it and so uh, 
the, um, the other students, we use their MCAS. They, they go over the data from the MCAS, the seventh and the eighth grade, and they're continually looking to identify the department chair's students who are scoring way up there, but they're not, you know, they're not taking the courses because sometimes, sometimes the students are fearful of, of what they're going to have to do in them. So um, the PSAT piece, I, I feel that looking at it, it's a much broader assessment in terms of what kids can do than the MCAS. So I think that the guidance counselors feel that they can really get a feel um, subject-wise, and it has so many more, you know, the subject areas that they can get a feel for where they might do very well. I'm just wondering because there, there may be a subset of that population that cannot cognitively take the courses, but then there might be another group that because, you know, for uh, accommodations that might be difficult to do, whether there might be another global assessment that could be offered in lieu of the PSAT, but that wouldn't be falling back on that MCAS data. So just trying to trying to make sure that both groups are treated equally. Uh -huh. Mr. Moore, and then Ms. Pickett. I, I had a different question, the same question about <laughs> the PSAT. Basically, you know, my, my impression of the PSAT, well, when I took it anyway, was that it tests what you have already learned and your ability to take the PSAT, but it doesn't identify, for example, you know, your um, enthusiasm, motivation, or sort of interest in what you're going to learn in the future. And so while it's pretty good, mm -hmm. there, there are always going to be people who will way outperform in a course they take what the PSAT would have predicted for them, just as there are going to be people who will way underperform what the PSAT would have predicted for them. And um, I think it, figuring out how to identify those kids is, I think, really important. And I, I, was, I don't know whether it would be just encouraging teachers to really pay attention to the kids who seem to have whatever it is in their, in, you know, in the prerequisite courses in terms of um, either interest or perseverance or whatever they think would be good characteristics to have to taking these courses to identify them independently of the PSAT. Um, I, I just feel like, well, I know that, there's, that that's true about the PSAT, that it's, you know, it's a rough thing, but it does not include some people who really do really well in courses much better than the PSAT would have predicted. Ms. Pick? Um, I had a comment, but first I, I would also want to speak to that. It, it's my understanding that the PSAT is kind of an additional means to ferret out some of those students, but the teachers are doing a pretty good job of actually talking to kids and encouraging them to take those courses. Mm -hmm. It's my experience in talking to my, my kids' friends and all of that anyway. They go through all of the schedules mm -hmm. and they call kids down if they feel that their schedule is, is too light or that they're not taking what they should take and they actually call the parents. So there, there's a lot of um, individuality right. as well. I just didn't want anybody to misunderstand it. Okay, it's thank only, you. If they do well on the PSAT, you can take a no. course, but otherwise, no. no. I, I just wanted to, to um, thank you and your council for, for all of this. As a, um, a parent of a recent grad and of a child who's going into the senior class, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with a lot of what's going on in the high school, and, and I've just been very impressed. Um, I, I think some of the new initiatives are great. I'm, um, I'm pleased to hear that the students are asking for student government. Um, because those are the kids who will go ahead and get, get involved in college student government, and um, I think that's an important thing for kids to know how to do that. Um, I think any any way that we give our high school students an opportunity to take leadership roles and to um, gain the confidence to be able to do that is a great thing. Um, and you know, a lot of these initiatives I know I use at home. I think the end grade's been very helpful as just a way to be able to quickly check in and see where things are and to know what's going on in the classrooms and be able to talk to your kids about them if if you need or want to do that. And um, I've, I've just. Um, you know, I've heard plenty about what's going on in the advisories, and I think that's been a tremendous thing. I, I love the idea of kids mixing um, genders and across grade levels and finding common themes to discuss um, from, their, from their own perspectives. I think that's really, really important. So um, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Minnick. I have um, a couple of questions. I think um, the first is on the technology uh, section. The number four says engage 85% of students in classroom technology instruction to improve student learning. What exactly does that mean? It means that when the students go through the high school that they have an experience within their <coughs> classroom setting because we don't have computer <coughs> classes, that um, they're using the technology that we do have. Uh, I think that 
it's also on the other side, it's, it's, the, it's a teacher strategy as well um, that we're, we're trying also to get teachers, all teachers, to use the technology that we have available and they're really, they're jumping on board with it. So we're trying to embed the instruction piece in the classroom so that the students as they leave, they will have um, some experience with, te with technology, whether it be using the, doc you know, the document camera, the LCD projector that we have, um, the PowerPoint piece, you have the personal finance class, they have turn it in, you know, for their, um, their English papers to be able to navigate all of them through it because we don't have the computer classes as yet. Okay. So then that makes me ask, why does it say engage 85% of your students and not 100%? That's actually a good question. <laughs> I mean, I, at first I wasn't, I wasn't clear what the goal was, whether it was actually about curriculum integration or whether it, was, whether it was teaching technology or whether it was using technology to teach. And you answered that question, but if it's, if it's kind of both, uh -huh. then the question, why, why did we pick 85%? Are there 15% that won't, that won't benefit from it or that already know it? Or is that, or do we just feel that we don't have the, an, that the teachers aren't ready or? Well, I, I think 100% that would work, but I, I'm not sure that, that I would meet that goal. Yeah. But I, to say 100% probably is, it's a, be, it's a better thing to say 100%. And then I'll come back to you and say, well, <laughs> yeah, we, I tried. <laughs> yeah. tried and we'll, keep well I mean, I, I, just, I just wondered if we were just gonna ed, go ahead and admit that we, weren't, that we were missing some kids <laughs> right up front or, or what. So that, I mean, it would make me happier if we said we were going to try for everybody, but it's not my plan. So. If I can help you with that answer a little bit. In creating your SMART goals, you have to have reasonable, achievable, rigorous goals. Okay. And so, obviously, right now, you don't have 85% of the students engaged in technology and classroom instruction, and we want to work toward that. 100% um, of course would be what we would shoot for, but we don't have the infrastructure or the equipment to guarantee that we could do that. So we'd be setting up a goal that we'd fall short of. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I have another question somewhere, I think, which was uh, maybe, I'm, I'm not even sure where it was, but it was regarding credit recovery and... Um, right above the 85%. Okay. And um, an MCAS remediation. I'm curious, you mentioned online classes, which is, I, I, I like everything that you said, by the way. I should, I should have said that right out of the starting <laughs> gate. I thought everything was great. I, it looks wonderful to me. My, but my question is, I feel that this district does not utilize the services of the collaborative for MCAS remediation and, and or for credit recovery, and I'm curious why not. Well, I and I well, thought that it, it, I thought that it came down to some kind of like business or scheduling or some other funky decision that had less to do with theory and, than with practice. But maybe I'm wrong. No, we've we've had the opportunity to sign on to two grants: one with um, the collaborative and one with the Lower Pioneer v Valley Educational Collaborative. And it was actually two math courses, and one was um, actually written by teachers, and there was a, a teacher on the other side of it. Um, they were both very difficult to navigate. And the, the reason I think that they were difficult to navigate was because it was so new. And I think that as we move along, this was two years ago that we signed on. Last year, we actually had one of our teachers teaching it, and the kids couldn't get through all the modules because of, of the, um, the length of it. And also, um, the, there was no um, visuals. It was just, you know, writing. The ones they do today, like Plato and... and um, EDU 2020 I was telling you about it's incredible they actually have live people talking to you um, you know you can have a, somebody do a lecture um, you, there's in, interactive lessons and dead people talking is a bad one the zombies no. are no good <laughs> <laughs> you said that you, they have live people and I just heard the comment over here and I know the, dead people talking is we don't like the zombie teachers yeah <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, so that's why, and if they do have something that we can use, we always are open to, to doing that. But that's the okay. two, the math, and they were just, they, it didn't work. So okay. um, Donna Cannell Brown and Beth Victor actually developed the digital, digital literacy course. Digital, digital literacy course, and it was very good. It was very good. The kids really liked it, and um, they were very successful in it. Well, that's good. Thank you.
I actually think zombie courses would be quite popular. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Every with the undead. <laughs> okay. Uh, next is um, Bridge. Bridge Street School. <clears throat> Evening. <clears throat> okay, um, I'm just going to quickly go over our school improvement plan for last year and um, highlight the differences for the coming year. Um, we had chosen to focus on math. That's one of the areas that um, of weakness in the Bridge Street School MCAS scores. And so we spent most of our year focusing on putting things into place to hopefully improve students' understanding of math. Um, the under, uh, improved math achievement for all fourth and fifth grade students, the first goal is to uh, achieve at least a minimum of 50% on the uh, of growth on the growth model. That means that students have improved um, into the mid-range um, based on the Department of Education's uh, formula. Uh, in the, let's see, 2000, uh, fiscal um, 2011 MCAS, our students had, um, as far as the student growth in math, had been less than 50% for all uh, three of the tested grades, and so um, that was pretty concerning, so we wanted to have children make at least average progress. Um, so that's that was our goal. We don't know if we've achieved it yet. I've been online several times in the past few days um, getting prepared for this to see if I could kind of tease out that information, even though some preliminary data um, is available. Um, that specific level of data is not available yet. And um, when I went online um, this afternoon, uh, they don't have the um, uh, performance standard scores up yet for math. They do for English language arts, so which means how many children scored in the advanced category, how many children scored in the proficient category. So I can't even give you a rough estimate <laughs> of, of where we stand on meeting that goal yet. But um, hopefully by September, all of that information will be um, available for people. Um, the students, the second part of that goal was students receiving daily math instruction for 90 minutes using a uh, three-tiered model of instruction, which means that the teachers are using an RTI model that includes direct instruction with supplemental uh, support from um, other faculty members like Title I teachers, um, paraprofessionals, special education teachers, and also that teachers are planning lessons that allow children to access the content at where, uh, from where they are instructionally. Um, and it was that has been a was a big challenge this year for our teachers. It was a big challenge to um, work in the new schedule where. Um, we had mostly block instruction, so we had a large amount of instruction in math for 90 minutes at a time, which was quite different than what we had done in the past. And I think it, especially at the beginning, it was pretty um, uh, challenging for teachers to figure out how to balance the and pacing of the classes to make it possible for kids to have the stamina to last through, through a, a class, a 90 minute class of math. Um, it reminded me of when the high school moved to the to the uh, the block schedule, and um, it was pretty challenging at the beginning of that for teachers to figure out, you know, teaching in the 80-minute blocks. But I think by the end of the year, we really um, the teachers had worked out a really good system each for at each grade level for how they were integrating math, <coughs> the math class. So, I, I, well, anyway, I'm going go on in that because it's just it's. Just, it, pretty technical, but. Um, so 100% of the teachers will participate in weekly grade level meetings to analyze the student data. Um, we did get 100% of teachers participating, although it was hard to keep up with weekly meetings. Um, so I can't say 
that um, we were able to really meet weekly. We did try to meet regularly. Um, there, I'm hoping as we move into the um, professional learning communities, we will find a way in the elementary schedule to provide you know some time for teachers to actually um, meet that way, whether it's after school or in some other kind of configuration of the schedule, but it's still pretty hard to get teachers from each grade level um, to be able to meet for a chunk of time once a week. They have so many other things that um, take up their planning. That's their, their prep period, so um, they only get four prep periods a week, and it's challenging to um, fit this type of work into that schedule. Um, collaborating with families to support student learning. 100% of the classroom teachers and SPED teachers will communicate monthly with families to regularly monitor um, the level of rigor of student learning tasks. We were concerned that um, the students would be overly stressed as we added time to the, to the instructional day and really ask them to um, engage um, you know, with a lot more mental effort in their regular tasks uh, for learning in math. And we took a quick um, survey of the school of the, from the parents in October to just to find out, you know, how, whether their kids were feeling particularly stressed about the amount of work that they were being asked to do and about the changes in the schedule. And the results of that survey basically indicated that everybody was pretty much taking it in stride, so we just kept going. <laughs> So, um, but um, the teachers did actually um, put out a real effort this year to um, communicate with parents on a much more frequently frequent basis with newsletters and uh, activities in the class and volunteers in the classroom. <coughs> um, and so there was like tons of uh, involved parents in the uh, building all year long. In fact. Um, a very small, very dedicated group of parents spent a huge chunk of their time uh, leveling all the books in the classroom libraries and leveling the books in our literacy center, which is very time consuming, but very, very um, useful for the classroom teachers because the goal of our literacy program now is to have children reading the just right books at their instructional level. And so we had to, in, to in order in order to, for children to be able to have the biggest selection, we have to level all the books so that they can, they know which ones to choose from, and uh, so that was a big big task. And the, and I really have to give a big thank you to the all the parent volunteers that worked really hard on that. <clears throat> um, we did have two family math nights, um, one for the pre K two level, one for the uh, three five level. They were fairly well attended. The younger, the math nights for the younger children actually had almost twice the attendance of the, of the math nights for the older children. <clears throat> but I think it, it was the timing. We did the younger one first and by the time we did the um, second one, it, we were getting into the sports um, schedule. So that kind of uh, diminished a little bit of the um, participation. So uh, in next year's plan, we're changing the dates so that we can make sure that we don't, that doesn't interfere with anything like that. Um, they were wonderful. The parents loved them. The teachers loved them. Everybody got involved. The kids lo loved them. Uh, it was really nicely organized, um, a lot by, a, by a, a committee of teachers led by the Title I math teacher at our building. And the parents, and the families went home with games to play with their children that they played both in the classroom and during the math night. And uh, it, was a, it was a great night, those great nights. Um, we, on goal number three, was 100% 100 of the teachers will engage in meaningful professional development activities. Um, well, we did, 100% engaged in meaningful professional development activities. Not all of them were directly related to the RTI model. Um, we, there was a lot of competing uh, needs for professional development. Um, we 
um, had a lot of professional development in um, a readers workshop with Jenny Bender and um, we had a lot of professional development in math around differentiated instruction um, and we are learning about how to effectively implement the RTI model but we're not totally there yet. Um, so the, that'll continue for next year. Um, the highlights for, la for last year, uh, we had basically three main, well, the three R's for last year that we were focusing on. One was resilience, the other one was relationships, and the third one was rigor. And um, we picked resilience because um, it's one of the factors that really make it possible for kids to be successful regardless of the challenges that they face. And it was a I think there are a lot of things that teachers can do to actually encourage resilience. Um, a lot of it has to do with teaching kids how to think um, and uh, different ways of talking to themselves about um, meeting the challenges that they face. And uh, so we did spend some time as a faculty um, really um, planning and talking to the kids, to the students about uh, resilience and how to, how to maintain it. Our relationship, um, there's a lot of um, uh, research around the effectiveness of positive relationships in the classroom with the, with the, between the teachers and the students. <coughs> and that's something that we also spent a lot of time focusing on, helping um, teachers um, understand the value of a personal relationship that is with their um, students that you know, obviously has the appropriate boundaries, but at the same time keeps kids feeling connected and engaged. It's one of the things that really helps engage kids in their learning. And rigor, that is the stamina piece. And that was one of our key um, focuses this year, was on helping our students um, understand that being smart was not getting something quick the first time very easy, but that it was something that develops over time with a lots of effort and really putting in a lot of mental thought and energy into solving problems of greater complexity. And um, a lot of elementary children think that if you get the answer right away, you're, you're, the, you're really smart. Or if you finish the test first, you're the smartest kid in the class because they equate intelligence with being smart. I mean, um, yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> <laughs> they equate intelligence with being fast. But the fact of the matter is that what happens when kids have to actually have to struggle with really complex thinking, it, it's slow. I mean, people spend their lifetime figuring out one math problem, you know? And so we would never say those people weren't smart. <laughs> and so to help children really change their con conception of what being smart is um, because that gives them the motivation and um, some tools and strategies to really use their brain like a muscle and really you know work hard at it that working hard doesn't necessarily mean they're not smart or if they can't answer the question the first time it doesn't mean they're not smart um, so it helps them stay uh, up to the challenge of really uh, challenging material. And one of the things that we've been noticing in our, in our students uh, is um, this kind of, um, I, I think it's, who knows, maybe it's Google, but it's, everything is kind of quick and easy. It's easy to get the answer. And so they really don't have a lot of practice with really thinking about it. So that's, we picked that and we really worked hard at that this year because, <laughs> and to bring it back to the MCAS, when we were looking at our MCAS scores, kids were not answering the short answers. They weren't answering um, the open responses in any kind of elaborated way. And part of that was because it was just harder. You know, they were doing the multiple choice, that was okay, that was easy, but actually having to think and sit down and put their uh, thinking on, pe on a piece of paper about how they actually problem solved. You know, people were, the students were thinking that that was just way too hard. And so we decided we had to really focus on that particularly because that was gonna be a big handicap for them in their real life um, if they continue to feel 
that um, if it was too hard, you know, they just were going to back off it. Um, we all, another um, thing that happened this year was um, with the superintendent and myself and Gwen Agnew, we sat down with a number of education professors at the University of Massachusetts to start a, discussing how um, the elementary schools can begin to um, you, uh, collaborate in a more uh, uh, complete way with the University of Massachusetts. We met with professors of early childhood, um, uh, reading, science, um, all kinds of fascinating ideas and research that they're working on. They would like to have placements for their graduate students to do some some work and um, they were very supportive of helping you know kind of pull in some academic support to our after school programs and so I think over time that's going to really you know prove very fruitful. Um, let's see what else. <laughs> One of the things that we did this year um, because I, the parents really wanted it was we had one parent um, night to discuss on um, the math curriculum specifically and um, it was wonderful a teacher it was teacher led and the teacher basically gave us all problems to do math problems that the kids have to do mm -hmm. and uh, it was pretty funny <laughs> as, as we kind of struggled through and but it was wonderful because it was real it was a real life experience for the uh, parents of what the classroom is really like and how they how having more than one right answer works and really help them understand how kids are now thinking about math rather than just using the algorithm to solve it and it was really but we didn't know what to expect but parents were not ready to leave after an hour <laughs> okay <laughs> and um, so that we're gonna do it again actually um, earlier in the year probably in October um, tools of the mind it's wonderful curriculum that we're piloting um, in kindergarten fantastic um, unbelievably wonderful results it's a great program we're getting great support for it um, we have a lot of our kindergarten students leaving kindergarten now reading at a mid first grade reading level and honestly it is not with drill and you know, kind of um, soul-killing <laughs> practice or anything like that. It has been effortless and fun for all of the for the teachers, the the um, and the students. I just have to say, never in my career as an educator have I had teachers raising into my office over and over again throughout the year saying, you can't believe how great this is. You can't believe what the kids can do. I never really thought that this was going to be possible. Um, and it, that, to me, is like this indication of a really successful program, because the teachers themselves, in order to learn this and implement it, had to work incredibly hard. I think they worked on, on their own time almost every day last summer. And, um, but it paid off. It's a wonderful program. Um, and I'm really hopeful that the district will be able to um, eventually implement it in all of the schools. It's really, I, I can't wait to see what happens in first grade next year. I think that it's really going to set the ground um, to do a number of things, but certainly to improve um, students' um, academic achievement. But I think also it's going to prevent a lot of um, special education referrals. And um, so our first grade teachers luckily had an orientation to the program, so they're going to be able to um, continue that. So that's last year. Oh, and our, our school garden is, is reblooming, thanks to Ward 3 and a lot of hard work on the t part of the teachers and parents. So come on, if you are hungry over the summer, we have a kitchen garden outside the, the, the office door. There's going to be cucumbers and um, tomatoes and all of those good things. And <laughs> I have to say one more thing. It's one on more, the garden. It's on the war. I know. Sorry. It's on the Ward Three Garden Tour in August. So you have to come. And, see. <laughs> and uh, there's only two big changes for the next year. 
Um, there may be more, but I did not want to um, make any assumptions for the new principal. Um, I want her to be able to come in and do the kinds of things that she thinks are, is necessary to do. So, I, but I did change, um, instead of um, demonstrating improvement on the growth, using the growth model, I moved to using something that's more closely related to the actual MCAS score, and that is moving students from uh, one quartile to the next um, as they're doing, uh, in needs improvement, they have, they have low needs improvement, middle needs improvement, high needs improvement, and so what we're attempting to do now is to move kids up the, that ladder. Um, <coughs> and the only, and the only other one was adding additional family nights for curriculum um, for, in math for families and moving that closer to the fall and having the family fun nights that the kids attend um, in the well, early spring, late winter. So, yes, okay, I'm done. Are there any uh, comments or questions, uh, Ms. Pitt? Oh, thank you, Johanna. Um, I just want to acknowledge that I know this is the last time that you're presenting a school improvement plan to us. Um, I will miss the, the one more thing you always <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to. But, you know, I've always seen it as that you, you, the one more thing is usually, oh, you're so excited, and you can't forget to say this in this <laughs> because you're so devoted to your school and to your students and to your staff, and it's always so clear when you make presentations to, to us. I want to specifically comment on, on a balance that I heard in your presentation that I really appreciate and from a personal place, um, and that's the, the, the balance that you are trying to strike in your building between improving um, technology and exposure to technology while also recognizing that um, learning isn't about speed because I think kids at all age now are exposed to so much that didn't used to be part of education and you know you want to know how to spell a word you don't go to a dictionary you go to the little icon on the bottom of your screen or you want to know what time it is you look at your, you don't look at your watch and figure it out you look at your clock which tells you digitally right and you know that you want to know how to do something they don't figure it out for themselves they go to Google on how to do such and such so I think it's really important for teachers to learn how to stress all that critical thinking. And we use that word, you know, kind of um, um, very easily and, and often these days. But it's such an important concept to, to help kids know that they can um, solve problems, big and small, of all kinds, on their own without jumping to technology to answer the question. And at the same time, teaching them what's good about technology that's available to them to be able to use and to know which, which is appropriate when. So I really appreciated the part of that that I heard in your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Meyer. So I, I would um, want to say I think the emphasis on metacognition is really great. And I was just wondering, obviously some of that's going to translate <coughs> into achievement growth. But are you doing anything else in terms of assessing those things that are more attitudinal so that um, asking students, you know, doing a survey at the beginning of the year, asking them to describe, you know, what a great student looks like, and maybe at the end of the year, ask them to describe what a great student looks like, just to note how those things differ. And and I think, you know, as a teacher, that would be a great, a great progress to see within one year, that shows that the students are absorbing those things and making them part of of their view of education. I love that idea. Um, we have not done it as a school, as a whole school. I will definitely mention it to the faculty. Um, what the classroom teachers have done has been have it at the beginning of the year, they will have the students identify the areas that they personally feel are challenging and they personally feel they're strong in. And that's revisited during the year when they set goals. But as a school, no, we haven't done it. That might be really something great to do. And just for the students as well, yeah. to look, you know, to look at how yeah. their views of what's, you know, of what resilience means. And I think because those things are transferable outside of school to personal relationships to, you know, to cross their entire life, I think it's, you know, so valuable. I think sometimes students can miss that because they get an MCAS score back, but they don't get a rigor. You know, right. Respect for rigor, resilience in the face of challenges score, but it's still there. Yeah, so. that, that's a good point. Mr. Orr? 
Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's great that you're doing these uh, family math nights. I know those have um, been successful at Jackson Street, too. And one other thing I know that's been successful at Jackson Street is the uh, morning math club. And I was wondering if there's been any thought given to replicating we, that at yes. Street. Yes. Um, our Title I math teacher tried a lot to do that. In fact, we had a student transfer from Jackson this year, and he hounded us for like months to have a morning math club. And we really tried. Our, we ran into a transportation problem. Um, because so many of our kids come on the bus uh -huh. that um, we just couldn't get them there. We asked parents if they could do it. We looked at possibly carpooling. We looked at doing it after school, different, you know, kind of trying to tweak it in different ways, but we just could not <coughs> overcome that barrier. And one of the things that we had talked about with the professors at UMass was the possibility of writing some grants that could include transportation uh -huh. so that we could provide some of those types of activities along with transportation uh -huh. so we could get the kids there. Um, yeah, we were really gung-ho to do that because it seemed so perfect. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Other comments or questions? I just wanted to add my own sort of personal, um, you know, this, uh, fortunately this is the first school improvement plan presentation. <laughs> I've heard you give as a school committee member now, and um, people asked, but I just wanted to say on a personal note, uh, you know, you were principal to my two kids, K through five, and, and just thank you for all you did for them and for the Bridge Street School community, and um, and just good luck in the next adventure and, and the next thing that you're going to be doing with the district. Thank you, thank you. Yes, um, Brian already has me hard at yes. work. We know. We know. <laughs> I'm just sorry that you're down to one page so that you don't get to put the cover with oh, the I know. going all the way around the, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 just, I just couldn't, you know, <laughs> I, that's the envelope I wouldn't, I wouldn't stretch. Um, I, I do want to say thank you to you guys because really I can't say I've been in working in a ton of districts, but I have never known or heard of a school committee in a community that has been as you know, basically supportive of the schools as Northampton. I, I don't, you probably don't get to see lots of other school committees, but I read the paper. And, <laughs> um, and as dysfunctional as we are, we're not the worst you see. Well, you know, I, I guess I just have to honestly say, you know, I've been here for a while, and what strikes me about the school committee as a group is basically always the kids came first. Always, always, always. And, there, and it's rare that it's not just a bunch of personal agendas or, you know, people doing other kinds of things, but really I think that that's a value of Northampton and it has made doing my job very much easier. I will definitely say that. And, you know, really I've told everybody these have been the best years of my life, so I'm very grateful to Northampton. Thank you. Next is uh, Principal Smith with a presentation from Leeds Elementary School. Good evening. And first off, thank you for the opportunity to let me share my school improvement plan with you all. Before I start, I'd like to let you know that the focus of my school improvement plan is mathematics as well. Despite the head of the um, theory of action containing English language arts. Excuse me. Would you mind speaking up just a little or into the mic or something? Sure. I apologize. Despite um, English language being on the header, um, Jenny Bender, who is the district's coach, <coughs> literacy coach, has done a phenomenal job with um, organizing professional development ongoing and, you know, uh, throughout the year. So therefore, it's a district initiative, and I felt it not necessary to put it on my school improvement plan. So I'm just going to focus on math and the things that I have been doing under my leadership. Um, with that being said, the first goal is aimed at improving the scores of students with disabilities in grades three through five. Um, and some of the outcomes, well first let me tell you the format of what I'm going to do so that where there's no mistake. I'm going to talk about the goals and then I'm going to talk about the outcomes and then I'm going to move on to the goals for the school year 2012-2013. So let me back up a little bit. 
So for the first goal, the aim was to improve the scores of students with disabilities in grades three to five, from 66 to 73 percent as measured on the MCAS. And so one of the outcomes was that I had 100 percent of the Leeds teachers visit the NARA school, and thank you, Mike Flynn, uh, for sharing your space and your colleagues and your students as well. And so I had 100 percent of the teachers go visit that school. Why? Because uh, the things that Mike was doing over there with his teachers, with technology and math, were phenomenal, I thought, when I visited. So I was very impressed with that, and I thought it was good for Leeds teachers to go over there and witness that, that um, technology can be used in the classroom and is being used successfully. And the teachers came back very excited. Uh, for goal two, the target was for new teachers without a professional status. And some of the outcomes were, <clears throat> Over the course of the year, teachers were evaluated twice and met three times with the principal to discuss their professional growth plans. Leeds had, I hired four non-professional status teachers in kindergarten, first grade, second, and third grades. And all four teachers have created weekly meeting schedules with math coaches in the building. In addition to that, teachers maintain anecdotal meeting notes and logs. <coughs> For goal three, um, the goal was targeted to all students K through five, and that was a technology goal. So what I wanted to do was to increase the, uh, the understanding and deepen the knowledge of computer-based instruction with teachers and students. And I did that via a number of ways. I uh, relied on the district's tech support personnel to work with my teachers and on how to do simple things like uh, set up smart boards, uh, put up projectors, and so forth in their classrooms. In addition to that, I had the uh, district tech personnel provide uh, ongoing professional development. The Lee School Council created a survey through SurveyMonkey, and that survey was for me to look at how technology was used prior with teachers in my building and what teachers wanted from technology. So it was a very useful tool and it really didn't tell me what I didn't know already, that if teachers were given the opportunity with technology, they would run with it. So given that example of how they went to the NARA school and got very excited about using math investigations uh, on whiteboards and smart boards was a prime example. In addition to that, the, the, the school district's special education supervisor trained uh, leads ESPs on AIMSWeb, and AIMSWeb is a monitoring system that's very, um, very modern, and it's to improve students' reading scores. Uh, in addition to that, the district tech support person created a schedule with teachers so they can um, be readily available for them throughout the school year. And Rob Adams, our tech person, was very instrumental in providing the equipment, setting it up for teachers, and so forth. Goal four was targeted to supporting low-income students. Those students I felt looking at the uh, 2000, when I came out in 2010, looking at that cohort of students, they weren't faring well at all. In fact, none of the lead students were faring well at all. Uh, we didn't make AYP in math, but looking at that cohort in particular, they, their grades were atrocious, plain and simple. So, what I decided to do was to um, have 100% of the faculty and students, student support personnel, um, have grade level meetings, analyze the MCAS, MCAS ah, data, getting late. Um, also, um, to use that data to drive the instruction. It's one thing to have data, but to use it to drive the instruction is another story. So therefore, I had um, <coughs> the district's um, technology director come down to my school and work with the teachers during the staff meetings on how to analyze data and how to then turn it into uh, meaningful instructional practices. 100% of the students and families in low income category were personally called by myself to be participatory in uh, the AM tutoring program, which I started in 2010. In addition to that, ESP staff received in services on how to use the MCAS data themselves. I met with the, M I met with the ESP uh, staff twice a month and I um, unpacked the data with them and I showed them how to use targeted instruction during the AM tutoring program. 
Also, the direct technology director um, showed my data team how to access the data from the data warehouse, which was very meaningful. And then they took that data and they shared it with the um, faculty as a whole. 100% of the classroom teachers in grades three to five um, shared their MCAS open response results with their students, illustrating the use of rubrics and student exemplars. They also examined best practices in grades three, four, and five. Teachers shared their exemplars with their students in the classes. Teachers created math word walls, which is something that was unheard of at the time, and they also had uh, math vocabulary charts throughout the building. Teachers conspicuously posted their rubrics in their classroom so students could self-monitor and self-regulate how well they're doing in math. So as I look to the upcoming year, based on a very limited budget, I had to get a little creative. Uh, this past year, we had a freeze on our, our school's budget, so therefore we couldn't <coughs> do a lot of professional development. But nonetheless, life goes on. So what did I do? I um, solicited the services of the community, working with uh, Smith College professors to come and do some professional development, and that's going to be an ongoing thing. We just um, solidified a three-year collaboration with Smith College, and they're going to be doing chemistry, um, chemistry workshops with our school from now until 2015. So they're going to do it via the AIMS program, which is a program for women at Smith College who are underserved, and they're going to be coming to Leeds and working with, collaborating with our teachers and working with our students to design uh, meaningful goals, meaningful assessments and formative assessments, and also to align the curriculum in chemistry. Now, that's not like a big deal for second graders, but they're going to make it grade level appropriate for students. And it's, it's very exciting. I'm very excited about that. And like I said, it's three years, and it's at the cost of zero to the district. In addition to that, newly hired classroom teachers and special education teachers will participate in summer math and professional development. So already the new hires that I've hired this year, special ed teachers, fifth grade classroom teachers, they are already signed up to go to math training this summer and also to go to responsive classroom training. I have 10 teachers going to responsive classroom training in Avon, Connecticut in August through a grant that uh, my friend Mark Prince, my dear friend and beloved friend, uh, Mark Prince had written for Leeds. In addition to that, the educational support staff will receive training and investigations on two professional days. Training will be, be provided by the Leeds math coaches. So these are no-cost ways of uh, getting around um, the budget rolls of the district that we will provide professional development for our staff. In addition to that, <clears throat> during the fall of 2012, lead math coaches will provide professional development at least twice a year during the school year to 100% of the special ed staff. I want to make sure that my special ed staff are instructing their students the same way the regular classroom students instructed. And finally, uh, looking at goal number two, oh, sorry, I'm moving a little ahead of myself. Yeah, looking at goal number two, if, um, if I purchase more LCD projectors, which I've done, I've purchased five so far, and I'm going to put those in the classrooms, and my goal is to make sure that every single classroom by the summer of 2013 has a LCD computer equipped uh, projector in each classroom mounted. So right now this summer, there's five going up in the classrooms. And I had teachers do a lottery system where they, uh, you know, it was a lot of fun. They will pick and see who's going to get there. Because I couldn't decide on who's going to get them and who's not going to get them. So I let them decide that through a lottery. And it was pretty fun. So um, I'll make sure that every single classroom has it first. And we also have a science uh, center through a Lego grant that was created and written by the uh, PTO and myself. And so that money is going to be used to uh, get a science lab up and running. And we're going to use enrichment monies from the Leeds uh, after school programs to fix that up. And then mid-year mid in the fall, we are going to create 
an on-site classroom at the Meadowbrook Apartments. And so Barbara Black and I are going to co-write a uh, grant for that, and it's going to target that low-income population of Leeds. And that is about it. I don't want to talk about the highlights. You'll get that later. But that's the, that's some bolts of my presentation. Thank you. Any questions? Are there any questions for the principal? Yes. Well, I'd like to make a statement. Um, I had the honor, the privilege of going to um, Leeds Science Night when I was over there, and I was so impressed at all of the different levels of participants and, and what they presented. Um, and I, I think it's going to be great to even take that further. But um, I just wanted to note that. For, I was just so impressed. I just spent the evening, and so did my daughter, who's 10. She was just totally in awe that some of the kindergartners and the first graders had, had done some of the programs that they had done. And I just wanted to say that done a great job that way. Well, thank you. Well, <coughs> what I see is science is uh, science and social studies are falling to the wayside with the MCAS craze of math and ELA. And so it's my mission to make sure that doesn't happen. So we have grants for the Hitchcock Center and we're successful with um, Ted Watt mm -hmm. coming to train our teachers uh, for the past year. And we also, like I said, have this Smith College uh, collaboration going for three years from now until 2015. So I'm really committed to making sure that science stays and it's rigorous and challenging for our students. Well, actually, I think there were two. Um, we, um, the mayor and I went to the one on um, when, with Mr. Watts. The nation, yes. Yeah, um, I was talking, that is one, thank you. We were talk, I was talking about the other one that they had had not too long ago and it, I was just impressed at how much science and, and the depth of knowledge there and the inventions. Yeah. Very the talent. Very talent is there. Children. Is there. Well, thank you. Thank you. I got to hold a snake. Yeah, I have a picture. I heard about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you weren't you than me. <laughs> yes, you are. our animals in school. Yes. <laughs> 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 Zombies. Uh, Miss Minnick. Animals in the classroom. Um, I have a question on the grant for the Meadowbrook um, <clears throat> classroom that you're going to do. Are you talking about applying for an NEF grant? Is yes. That, okay. Mr. Bourne. I'm interested in the Meadowbrook on-site classroom, too, because I think it's a really intriguing idea. Could you just talk a little bit more about what the plan is? I'm wondering if it's also something, if it's successful, could be maybe replicated at Hampshire Heights or other sure. places like that? I'd love to. So um, in 2010, I, I noticed that 80% of our low-income students come from the Meadowbrook apartments. And no coincidence that those students are performing poorly uh, academically at school. Those students cannot get to my AM tutoring program in the mornings for tra transportation and the myriad of reasons. Uh, so uh, I decide to bring the educational site to them. Something I wanted to do, like I said, since 2010. I wanted to get to know the culture of the school first. I wanted to get to know, get to know the culture of the community as well. Having done that, I'm ready to move forward with this and you know, create a classroom on site. We're inheriting 10,000 books from the Clark School, and I'm setting up a library down at the Metal Book Apartments. Great idea. Thank you. Other questions or comments? I'm sorry. That's okay. I, I just wanted to acknowledge how many times we heard tonight, and actually in all of our school improvement plans, how much the local colleges are contributing to our schools with their um, their educators as well. And you talked about Smith and Johanna talked about um, UMass programs. And I think it's great the more that we reach out to them and they can look to us because we're we're providing grounds for their students also to be to be learning. It's a it's it's a win win. It's a, um, mutual um, kind of set up that way. But I th I think it's wonderful that we are. Um, reaching out that way and allowing them to reach out to us and, and being able to um, use them as a resource in our schools. Absolutely. Well, the goal is... We talk about, you know, our teachers Sorry. have so much to learn from each other. We have other teachers in our local colleges, and I think it's great that we're, we're learning from them, too. Absolutely. So the goal is to have uh, a pipeline from the NPS school system to Smith College where students, I envision students going to school on the campus in the summertime, learning engineering and science and such courses. That's something I was a part of in Amherst with Amherst College. Mr. Meyer. Oh, I just want to say that the 
the staff at Leeds that I spoke to are very excited about the Science Center and about the resources of having Smith students to assist in, assist in teaching and bring materials and do lesson plan development. Uh, it's going to be a really great addition to the school community. Thank you. Any other questions? Or okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Enjoy your summer. Yeah. Thank you too. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Okay. So that concludes the uh, the uh, school improvement plan presentations for this evening. Mm -hmm. um, is there any old business that we need to take up? I don't believe there is. Any new business? Okay. Just um, um, an update um, from the no team that's working on the superintendent's evaluation tool. That the superintendent is meeting with um, Lisa and Alden and me and. Um, just as a heads up at the next meeting we are hoping to present you with the new evaluation tool that you will be filling out so make sure you put some time aside for that uh, start gathering up your the, the data that we have from over the year um, but we're, we're moving right along with it and huge huge thanks to Nicole for uh, making it a priority in her last weeks to um, t type up the um, this huge rubric that we're using um, much 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 so um, the, you all will be getting your evaluation tool um, at our next meeting, as will the administrators will be getting a, a feedback tool, we're not calling it an evaluation tool, but um, feedback, and there will be also an online um, tool for um, s staff to use. We'll, be, we'll, we'll hopefully be able to show you what that's going to look like at our next meeting. Okay. Um, any other new business items? Okay, so hearing none, I'll just review quickly again the um, future business and meeting dates, superintendent evaluation meeting, Tuesday, July 10th. Um, there will be a late start forum on July 10th, 7 p.m. here. Uh, rules and policies of the committee to be determined, and our next school committee meeting will be on July 12th, uh, 2012. Uh, then there's the alt retreat, school committee alt retreat on August 1st and the school committee meeting in August, scheduled for August 9th. I would now entertain a motion to adjourn. To adjourn. Oh, I, just, I just want to recognize, um, since this, I believe, is Nicole's <laughs> last meeting with the school committee, just thank her for her dedicated service um, to the school committee. Uh, she's exceptionally good at what she does, and we will miss her. definitely agree with that and I would like to add that this is probably the strongest exit of anybody I've ever worked <laughs> with. <laughs> Nicole has been on top of everything in these last few weeks, last few days, last few hours. Um, she is letting uh, nothing go. Um, no, no loose ends are being left. She's done a fantastic job of training Tracy and we welcome Tracy to the role. Uh, but really, her commitment and dedication to doing a great job is has lasted right up to the very last minute, and I thank her very much for that. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn now. Okay. Is there a second? Sure. Oh, okay. I thought maybe we were going <laughs> to be here longer. Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 aye